The one million dollars saga. Former minister Cecilia Abinadapa and the husband made a complaint to the police about theft in their bedroom, in their home. House helps were the ones pilfering in excess of $1.5 million, which only came to the attention when the husband caught one of them one day. In the court, and the documents filed in the court, all the money is described as the property of the former minister. Her husband is said to be the owner of property which is her suit and kente cloth, which they also stole. As it turned out, she wrote in her complaint that 800,000 of the money belonged to her dead brother who gave it to her dead mother who gave it to her for safekeeping. So, a number of questions arising. As the OSP commences a lifestyle audit of the former minister to assure himself or the office what ought to be done going forward. Questions come up. A dead brother died last year. Is there a proof that the money belonged to 800,000 of it, 800,000 of the dollars belonged to the brother? Is there proof that the brother gave this money to the old woman who also then turned it to her? Questions coming up. These seem to be lame excuses or explanations. <clears throat> the brother is not one without child, is it? And children who are not adults. So what is going on? Has there been a will? No will. Has there been letters of administration taken? And who in that has the court decided must take what part of this property? And why was it being kept with her all that while? If this money belonged to him, his brother, dead brother, who was a chief of the Asantehene, and through the legal processes, certain people would have been named as the beneficiaries of the particular assets or estates of that brother. Why was it still being kept with her and being pilfered over a long period until the husband chanced upon one of the house helps. Many questions coming up. What did the police do wrong? They investigated. They confirmed that indeed this amount of money had been stolen in excess of $1.5 million and they told no higher authority about it. They didn't bring it to the attention of the Attorney General. And the Attorney General only now, after the chronicle publication that led all of us to this story, is asking for the docket, and the docket has been taken to the Attorney General. When the charges were made in the court, and the facts were read, where was the complainant? Where were they? 
Cecilia Dapa and the husband. Didn't they hear the contents of the court processes? Did they not object? Why are they now objecting? Because the matter has become public. The police's process in the court, there was an original, it was amended once, it was amended twice. Why did the first correction not see what she's complaining about now? Why did the second correction not also take care of the complaint she's making now of inaccuracies or inconsistencies? This is the biggest issue we are canvassing for you this morning, looking at the OSP doing a lifestyle audit. What is lifestyle audit? There are questions of money laundering. What is that? The code of conduct for public officers, which would have checked some of these things. What is it and why has it not been passed up to now? We shall go to Adisa Dell to check how the bullying that harms and almost kills is allowed to go on there and whether this will be stopped, not only in that school, but all schools in the country. And the Pentecost Church of Ghana, or the Church of Pentecost, brings all our politicians together and other stakeholders. Actually, Parliament could not work because of a conference that the Church of Pentecost brought them to. It was about a, more, a national moral vision plan. Now there's a suggestion out of this conference that there ought to be set up a National Moral and Integrity Council. Really? I'm Samson Ladia Yenini. We'll be right back to deal with the Vex Martyrs. Welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here is a very brief take. I call it... Huh. So you first <clears throat> introduce you to Article 41. Many times I have taken you there to Article 41 of the 1992 Constitution of Ghana. And what does it say? Article 41 says, the exercise and enjoyment of rights and freedoms is inseparable from the performance of duties and obligations and accordingly, it shall be the duty of every citizen. So you have duties and obligations as a citizen. Among your duties and obligations is to uphold and defend the constitution and the laws of Ghana. To protect and preserve public property and expose and combat misuse and waste of public funds and property. And to contribute to the well-being of the community where you live. My take is a very simple one. Pay attention, listen, and watch this. And I ask the question, Nahu Kosam. What is the difference between the ordinary thief and a political thief? Number one, the ordinary thief steals your money, your bag, your watch, and your jewelry, isn't it? But the political thief steals your future, your career, your education, your health, and your business. Number two, the hilarious part is that the ordinary thief will choose whom to rob. But you are the one who chooses the political thief to rob you. Because we choose them. We vote them. We blindly say we are not blind. Who is deceiving who? The ridiculous part of the whole issue is that we will fight to defend and protect our belongings from the ordinary thief. Is it not? But we fight each other to defend and protect the political thief. Is that not what we do? Thugs will be fighting themselves to protect those that are stealing our career, stealing our job, stealing our health, stealing our success. And that is my take. 
This show is brought to you by the kindest sponsorship of Bank of Africa, as strong as a group and close as a partner, empty and everywhere you go. Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Robert and Sons Optical Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years. Duraplus, how you get your water matters. Remember where Duraplus goes, water flows. DBS Industries, roofing, papa pa fie. My way, dial star 165 hash on MTN to join my way today. Sherry Tree Properties, we develop spaces as though we're going to live, occupy them ourselves. Syntex Tanks, it's strong and it's tough. Flamingo Paints, simply superior. So call a friend, tell a friend to tell a friend that you need to be here on News File this morning. And my guest, Dr. Richmond Etiahene is Corporate Governance and Banking Consultant, Salman Partners and Financial Consult Limited. So you met him so many times during the banking crisis when uh, we hosted him almost every day. Doc, thank you so very much for making time to join us. Thank you too, sir. Great. Amechi in Sofo is cross-border asset recovery expert. Amechi, thank you so very much for joining us on News File today. Thank you very much. Right. So he's an expert who will help with his expertise on the questions we are asking as in lifestyle audit, what exactly is it? Money laundering, what is it? And we're also talking about the conduct of um, public officers' bill, which has seen over a decade in the hands of the executive uh, gone to parliament and ditched, and uh, we don't know where, what is happening to it now. But we have a lot to tell you about it. Dr. Justice Shremsai, I call him teacher. He's a senior lecturer, faculty of law, GIMPA, and managing partner, Praetorium Solicitors. It's been very difficult trying to get you onto this show. So today, we are thankful that you made time. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you very much. Yes, you do. <laughs> <laughs> Mary Awalana Ada is acting executive director, Ghana Integrity Initiative. That is a local chapter of the International Watchdog Transparency International. They have issued a statement on the back of the OSP's investigations, giving their support, but demanding that things should be swift and thorough, and that the OSP must inform the entire Ghanaian populace of what he finds as quickly as possible. Mary, thank you so very much once again for making time to join us. Thank you for having me. Great. And good morning to all of you. Right. Dr. Yao Pebi, medical doctor, global CEO, hub group and steering committee member, the Ghana Compact. He's a doctor, medical practitioner, but he's a very passionate patriot and he sees things that happen in this country, they just break his heart. And sometimes he even can't help but weep on national radio. Doc, Forgive me for reminding you of that event, but thank you very much for making time to join us. Thank you for having me, Samson. I am grateful. Great. We will also be joined by Alfred Chia Yeboah, Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice. You have heard him speak to some of these issues and explain some of the matters, particularly the call for the police to submit the docket to the Attorney General, which the police have done. Questions have been raised. Setting issues have come up. Mischief has been raised as well. He will help us to understand why they are getting it now. They are getting in now, and what they intend to do. Right. So many have said, "This is an individual. She's got her money, <laughs> and uh, she decides how to keep it. What's your problem? Why do you want to follow how she keeps her money?" Even if she decides to dig under her bedroom and keep it, what's your trouble? Anyway, from some of us, from where we sit, 
and from what we know. It is a very, very serious matter and an investigation that is going on. And we pray for uh, strength and protection for all the people who are involved, from the Attorney General's place to everyone else. Now, the reason it is not the usual common situation is that she has been a minister of this country. And it was during that period that this happened to her. In fact, since 2000 or 2001, she has been in public life, meaning we pay her, we take care of her, we feed her, we literally clothe her. She's chauffeur driven. She lives in a house that we pay for. So she must answer questions. Beyond that, she has superintended over humongous amounts of money into contracts for the state. You have heard about the over $40 million contract that she superintended over. There's the $100 million Kole Lagoon dredging thing that she superintended over. The president was there when uh, Tachia was minister to see what was happening at the place. And uh, I, I was going to bring you a footage, a very brief footage, to see when the president visited the Kole Lagoon and what were being promised. You heard about how that place was going to be turned into a recreational area, you know, and so on. I'll show that to you and seeking to justify why she has superintended over too much that belongs to the public. And that's why we have to ask the questions that we ask. So we'll begin with preliminary matters before we get into the major issues uh, regarding uh, lifestyle audit, money laundering issues, and the uh, public uh, conduct public officers bill. So let's begin with the lawyer uh, and law teacher who is in the studio. First of all, she says that there are inconsistencies in the matter as put out by the police. And this is why she told a story that has been projected on Saturday last week. That was like two days after the matter broke. Some of those who purported to speak for her were saying funeral donations were involved and her mother's money was involved. Some had actually said the money did not really belong to her. Her husband is a rich person, an accomplished architect, and so part of the money is hers. How does it happen? That critical question. Now, if you have heard anybody refer to the charge sheet and say that in the charge sheet, it is there that the money doesn't belong to her, tell that person that is a lie from the pit of hell. Because from the original charge sheet to the Second Amendment on the 5th of July to the 20, 20th July Amendment, it all says the monies belong to her. How that, does this happen? Please, let me watch this again. I was going to introduce you first to um, the money she has superintended over and what we wanted her to do for us. And that's why we cannot take it lightly that this is happening in her bedroom. Watch. This uh, dredging, cleaning up, is going to take about uh, six months to complete this one. Then the Kole Lagoon itself will take a longer time because that's where we have more composition of material which needs to take a longer time, maybe about uh, a year or two to finish. We're going to have recreational facilities. That is the, the sea outfall. So along we have recreational facilities, other infrastructure, we can have uh, some hotels, we come at the end. And this makes the whole place. Uh, then we're dredging all the way through cycle to Kole Lagoon, where we call the Clef Interceptor. From there, we end up at the estuary into the sea. Before the commencement of the work, this is how the situation was. The channels were heavily silted. Along the channel, you can see very heavy siltation. So this is the beginning. Then during the process of uh, the dredging, we had these uh, situations. Gradually, we came up to the end. Then finally, this is the stage that we have reached. 
and then after that there was a continuation to carry out the uh, the soldier because as we progress more souls come and it right so the site engineer there speaking to the president and his entourage his entourage when they visited the Koli Lagoon area or door and the distilling work that they were doing there the president was uh, there on the on the 21st of May 2019 and on that visit Cecilia Benadapa was a minister so she was there and what they told us was that this was going to be turned into a recreational center <clears throat> and a whole lot of things would change according to a letter from the controller and accountant general dated the 19th of March 2022 there was a bank transfer or bank transfer advice wherein the amount of 100 million Ghana cities was transferred from the sanitation and uh, from the sanitation and pollution accounts at the Bank of Ghana into the accounts of Dredge Masters Limited for the purposes of ensuring that this work was done. People are complaining, this place is still stinky and the problem persists. Practically nothing um, has been achieved. So there's good reason why people say we must ask her questions, not saying she's guilty, of course. So first to uh, Dr. Sramsai. So the, there was a first amendment, her complaints didn't get in there. There was a second amendment, her complaints didn't get in there. And as we have come to know, I have come to know, that in the complaints that she wrote to the police, already people are raising suspicions. What happened? Uh, have things changed somewhere? It is stated in there that 800 belongs to 800,000 US belongs to her brother, who is dead, it was given to her by her mother, who is also dead. What comes to your mind? How lousy could the police have been in doing and in the, in the facts never mentioned on three different occasions that the money belonged to someone else? Thank you very much. I think we need to go back to the basics. Okay. The question is, why do we have a police service and a criminal investigation you know, department, CID, of the police? It is simply because the law has acknowledged that in matters of crime, private individuals may not have the capacity or the skill to find the facts that are contestable or that are placed before a court. So in every criminal allegation or accusation, there is a requirement that either the police service or another law enforcement agency should conduct investigations. And these investigations are conducted with persons who have been trained to know the essence of evidence so that when the case is placed before a court of law, it will be tested by the standards of evidence and the rules of evidence. Now, when a private person makes a complaint, it is purely based on what she thinks or he knows and now that knowledge may not be sufficient to disclose, the, the, I mean, to, to, to create the amount of evidence that is required. So it is possible that, true, the Honorable Minister did not know how much she really has. That is one. It is also possible that she thinks she knows how much she has. But once the police came in, the police are able to conduct investigation far beyond what she you know, is capable of doing. So, for example, the police are probably likely to call these accused persons who have probably run away from the minister. minister Which they been. did retrieve some money. Uh, some of them used to buy houses. They have uh, put their hands on it. Some of them used to buy vehicles. They have put their hands on it. Some of them used to rent stores and so on. So They have taken back some of the money. So, from the summary of the facts in the charge sheets alone, you could see that the police have done more than what the complainant could do. So on the scale of who is more likely to be right, 
I think from the charge sheet and what the police have done, the number of people they've spoken with, the extent to which they went, I think every fair-minded person should be able to come to this basic conclusion that it is possible, I mean, that the police have more information on the, on the tracing of the money and on, the, on how, whatever happened more than the, what, the complainant herself. In any case, what prevents the complainant? I've, I've listened to all, I've read all the press statements and I've listened to the discussion, but not even once has the complainant herself come out with how much she thinks she has. You know, so it's not enough to just say, well, what the police are saying is not correct. You need to tell us that, well, I told them that this is how much I had. This is how much is missing. So I think they are lying. So compare their figure with my figure, and then let's know what the truth is. But never have I seen anything where a complainant is saying that, oh, the police are wrong. It is rather this. The police are wrong on this. It is rather that. So I think we will be, we will be spending our time not usefully if we continue to dwell on what a complainant is saying. I mean, you, you know that there have been so many instances where complainant comes out to say something to the police. The police conduct investigation. They, they dismiss the whole action. They look, what you are saying is not even correct because they've gone beyond what the complainant can, I mean, can do and then get a real, realistic evidence which will be placed before. There are also situations that you and I know, particularly that we conduct you know, criminal defense. And we can tell that this is a lousy investigator. They haven't done a good job. But we are happy that they have been lousy because we will defeat them. So it's possible that she says there are inconsistencies in the statements. Um, how come the, the curiosity arises when it has been amended twice, on the 5th of July and on the 20th of July, and in all those amendments, substantially, it remains the same? She put in her complaint that the money belongs to her dead brother, which was given to her by her dead mother. That doesn't find expression in the facts. And this has embarrassed her. That is possible. I mean, I was going to come to the other side that there were times when the police were more accurate than the complainant. And there were times when the police were less accurate than the complainant. The bottom line is this. What is, the, what is the extent of discrepancy between what the police are saying and what she has? Until she comes out with what exactly she thinks, we have no basis to still, I mean, to, to wait, or we have no basis to question what the police are saying. So unlike the situation where you are conducting a defense, where you are probably through cross-examination have shown that... The, the, what the, the discrepancy she is concerned about, which some of us have discovered from her statement to the police, even though questions are already being raised, whether that statement is the statement that the police used to work from the beginning, did the first amendment and did the second amendment, is that the USD, it, you, out of the one million, 800 US dollars belongs to her late brother and it was in her box and it was broken into and that the money was given to her by her late mother. And again, that there were funeral donations of 300,000 Ghana CDs or so as part of the money stolen. Um, so this, this for her are the two key things that bring the discrepancy. You see, that point is neither here nor there. Money which belongs to someone who is dead has been transferred to another person who is living. Do you still insist that the money belongs to the dead person? So I can see why a police will not be concerned about that line of discussion, because when you are dead and you have handed your property over to someone, and I assume that she be, what she is saying is that the money has been given to me, so she's now the owner. So the police are justified in saying that you are the owner of the money. Now, as to whether what she's saying that the money has been transferred and transferred or whatever, that will not even matter in the, in the job of the police, what they are doing. It won't matter because they are not investigating uh, the source of the funding. At this point, what the police are doing is to say that, look, someone owns a property, another person takes it, and now we are, we are investigating stealing. Let, let's, let's, not, let's not confuse the issues. Mm -hmm. At this point, the police are investigating stealing right. against some different people. They are not into the question of where did the complainant get the money from. So, there is nothing wrong with what the police have put on record. As far as they are concerned, the money was lawfully in her possession. Therefore, she is the owner at the time. 
and now they are prosecuting some other people. So now let's shift to the question of source. Mm. source but, but you are saying they shouldn't be bothered about whether she's the owner and that she's the owner because the money was in her possession. If she says, it's my brother who died, money who gave to my mother who is also dead. As a lawyer, the question that is triggered is if you want to say she's the owner. When somebody dies and they have relations, they have children, either they have left a will or if they died without a will, there will be an LA or letters for administration, yeah. which will spell out who takes how much of what. So could it be the case that as we speak, those things have happened and that the man's children and everybody, the money is for her, that's why she's keeping it. So that's what and I'm if you keep, if you deal with an estate, as in the property of a dead person, without having gone through the process, that's also intermeddling. That's also another different thing altogether. That's what I, I keep saying, that we need to separate the issues. At this point, you know, the offense of stealing, you actually don't need to find out who the owner of the money is. Okay. So when the policeman is prosecuting someone for stealing, all he needs to satisfy the court with is that there is another person who has taken something and has appropriated the thing which does not belong to him. As to whether it belongs to Mr. A, Mr. B, will not play much, probably any role in the, in the prosecution. Now, when we turn the, the, the table and we go back to source of the money, then that is where what you are saying will come in. Where did she get the money from? That would be, I think that is what the uh, special prosecutor is trying to do. You are saying that if a complainant goes to the police to say, you are too smart to say that, but I'm asking a question for the purpose of our viewers. Yeah. That complainant goes to the police and says, my car is missing. It's been stolen. The police won't confirm that in fact, he, you had a car and it has been stolen before they pursue it. You see, the police would confirm that you have a car and all right, but it doesn't take away. What I'm saying is that it doesn't take away. You see, what the, what the, the, the minister is saying is that the police should have put in their summary of facts that the money does not belong to me. It belongs to some persons who are dead, right? And I'm saying that from a practical point of view, if you're a police officer and you're prosecuting such a matter, your interest will not be the source of the money. Your interest will be who has possession of the money? Who is the complainant? Possession. Possession. Yeah, custody yes, of custody it. of the money. Who has who? So the legal ownership or the title to the money is a different question which will be gone into separately by another institution. Okay. So in as much as the police will be interested in who actually owns the car, in the matters of court and what they are going to do, they have no interest in tracking or tracing the source of the money up to the minister. So it is understandable why the police will not place much emphasis right. on where the money came from at this point. However, when another institution or even the same police is trying to investigate the minister for the source of the money, which is not the focus of what the police are doing now, mm. then they can go to, okay, you said this person gave it to this person, this person is dead, then they will ask the question you are asking, okay, where, where is the will that distributed the money? Even the person who died, what's their title to the money? Because Clearly, she's not a public officer. Mm -hmm. And whatever she has in her possession or even ownership or title to, we are interested in knowing. Okay. And it is our right to know. And it's her duty to let us know what the source is because she's a public officer. So while the same question may not be put to a private person, she is a public mm -hmm. officer. So pretending, like you said, over millions of public money. Mm -hmm. So if we find a situation of this kind of money in your, in your, in your, in your, in your, in your possession, we are entitled to know, and you are under every duty and obligation to tell us how you came by those amounts of money. Now, I think we need to, and that is the problem we face as a country in our national discourse. We need to draw, we need to make a decision as a country whether we are going to apply criminal law only hmm. to public issues, or we are going to apply hmm. principles of governance and transparency to our, our public affairs. The, 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 the outcome of the two will be different. Now, when we run a republic like ours, okay, and we are running a democracy, we are not in any way in a courtroom. We expect certain standards to apply across the board. And when those standards are applied and people are questioning whether someone complies with those standards, it is not an answer to reduce the whole matter to the, 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 what? the, the courtroom antics and the rules of evidence. You and I know that what happens in the courtroom 
is governed by certain rules which are completely different from what happens in life. So right. there are wrongs and there are crimes. Even though all crimes are wrong, not all wrongs are crimes. So we need to have that in mind. And we have to make a decision that, okay, going forward, are we going to judge our politicians, our leaders, our public officials, strictly by criminal standards? Or we are going to judge them so by governance? That will take us to the the substantive thing we want to discuss for looking forward into the future, the conduct of public officers' bill, and what it says, what it expects, the basic standards, minimum standards, it expects of, um, what do you call it, the public officers. Now, let me go on the line and first uh, speak to the Deputy Attorney General, um, Gof uh, I said Godfrey, sorry, <laughs> he used to be Deputy, uh, Alfred Tia Yeboah. Thank you very much, Senior, for joining us on News File. Thank you very much. Right. Brother. So you have asked for the docket. The docket has been delivered to you. The police issued a statement to say that they have delivered the docket to you. Why are you interested in the docket of something that the police is prosecuting already? And an aspect of the bigger matters as regards the source being prosecuted by or investigated by the Office of Special Prosecutor. Some say you are seeking to intervene and to do something untoward. All right, thank you very much. And good morning to the uh, panel. Now, the Attorney General is given the exclusive authority by our Constitution to initiate all criminal prosecution on behalf of the Republic. However, the Attorney General is not able to prosecute all the cases. And in view of that, various entities or bodies have been given the fiat by the Attorney General to prosecute on his behalf. That's right. One of such institutions is the police service. And let me also indicate that under our law, the Attorney General's office does not investigate cases. That power to investigate is with the police and other state bodies. So in the event that a complaint is lodged with the police, the police will have to investigate, and after the investigation, then they may want to go to court and prosecute on behalf of the attorney general. So in this particular case, a complaint was lodged, the police went investigate the complaint and on behalf of the Attorney General filed the charges and uh, 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 arraigned the accused person before the second court in Accra. But because the police prosecute on behalf of the Attorney General, they are under a duty to ensure that either the Attorney General is informed about such cases pending before court or they seek further intervention of the Attorney General before they even commence prosecutions in court. The practice has been that where there is a docket before the police, and depending on the nature of the, that particular case, they always make sure that they refer such a docket to the AG for its review and advice before they proceed. If you also look at the amount involved in this particular case, and the level of public interest in the matter. The police thought it wise that the AG's input ought to be stopped. And that's the basis upon which they took a decision to submit the docket to the Attorney General for his review and advice. Now, in the review and advice, the Attorney General having been seized with the full docket, the original docket, goes through every page of the docket to indicate whether the evidence on record will be sufficient to warrant the continued prosecution of a case. So in the review exercise, various decisions may be made by the Attorney General. One, the Attorney General may, after the review, say that Based on the facts on the record, the charges should be maintained. The attorney general also advised that based on the evidence on record on the docket, the charges 
to be dropped. The third option may also be that the charges may have to be amended, and by amendment, the charges may either go up or come down, or may even produce an entirely new charge. Mm. The Attorney General also reserves the right upon reviewing the docket to ask the police to conduct further investigations into areas that the AG thinks ought to have been gone into by the police. So, Council, if you look at the architecture within the AG setup, this is how it operates. In this particular case, the docket has been submitted to the AG. Our officers are working on the docket. When I say working, they are reviewing the docket. And depending on what we find in the docket, the various options already outlined, one or more of them may be activated. Mm. So as we know, like you said, uh, first degree offenses, some second degree felonies um, cannot be prosecuted unless on your instructions to who uh, should prosecute them. And, and this one, because of the involvement of the public officer, <clears throat> do you think that the police did, they aired when they didn't bring this to your notice, working on a matter of such, you know, magnitude? I will not say the police aired. The police, based on the authority that they have, the fed charges against some accused persons. And that has been the practice within the prosecution division of the police. The police prefer charges that they are allowed under law to prosecute stealing, dishonestly receiving, and conspiracy. So in terms of the approach that the police took, we will not force them for doing it. But so far as they prosecute on behalf of the Attorney General, they are required under certain circumstances that stated already to submit documents to us for our review. And this particular case, in view of the nature of the case, the amount involved, and as we said, maybe the complainants involved, right. and the interest of the public, it is appropriate that the documents submitted to the agency. So would you have thought that in a matter like this, the police ought to have exercised the discretion at the very start to consult the attorney general who gives them the power to prosecute before commencing the process? I think that would have been a better approach, even though what they did wasn't wrong. That would be a better approach mm. because of the complainant in this particular case and the nature of the case. Yeah. Is it early to ask that by your review so far, what is likely to change? I may not want to come out currently, but I think possibly within the week or two of last, the AG will issue a letter to the prosecution that the police ask to what the first to be done. They are still working on it. Great. Now, the, the public perception from your request to the police and the police forwarding the, the docket to you and telling the whole world about it is that you are seeking to interfere with the Office of Special Prosecutor who is independent of the politicians um, to interfere in the matters because the AG's office, you are a politician, so to speak, even though you are a, constitution, a constitutionally created office. Um, this is your colleague. You sit in cabinet with her. And because of that, the nature of the matter, you have now sought to do this. Can you explain why you have now decided to, bring, to come into the matter and whether or not you are seeking to take away what the special prosecutor is doing? All right. Now, if you look at the OSP Act, the areas within which the ASP, sorry, OSP is mandated to investigate into or inquire into have been clearly set out. Corruption, corruption-related matters, some aspects of procurement, public uh, 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 lifestyle audit, etc., etc. We are not going to go into those areas 
Because those areas are the areas that the OSP is going into. We are rather looking at the other target. Healing is honestly receiving conspiracy and other ties that we think may uh, arise out of our review of this document. So there's no attempt whatsoever to, as it were, be in conflict with the West of the OSP. Okay. Our interest is about what the police have done, mm. what are the charges they've preferred are uh, maintainable in court, whether they are to be reduced, enhanced, or whether they have to look at other areas that they've not gone into. Thank you very much. Um, okay, Justice wants to, is there a question? It's a quick comment. Okay, a quick comment. Then I would, uh, I would get uh, uh, Dr. Perby and then Dr. Um, um, Rich Wonder Tuahine also say what they have to say quickly. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, do you recall that the Attorney General a few weeks ago issued a statement to the public and said that when the Attorney General is doing its work or their work, they don't look at who is involved. They don't look at anything. They just look at the law and the evidence. You recall, that was in respect of, uh, I think it was when they, uh, they were calling for nolly prosecutor in terms of the... Uh, yeah, uh, yeah Now, the Deputy Attorney General is telling us that this morning, that when you look at the person involved in this matter, they think that they have to what, require, request for the docket. Now, this is the problem we have with this system. That is why there is no trust in the way things are done, and that is why people are complaining about them. Once you request for the docket, people start complaining because experience has taught us that this regime is not following what we ought to follow. Let's be honest with ourselves. This is stealing. How many stealing cases are in this country today? How many of them do we, would the Attorney General request the, the docket we brought to Probably them? none. You see? So when the Attorney General comes in, in a simple case of stealing, Okay, and is requesting for the docket. And now the Deputy Attorney General is telling us that they are requesting for the docket because of the person involved. The then public the, interest, that's what he said. No, he said the person involved yes. first, then he said the public interest. Of course, every criminal case is a public interest matter. That's why so, the state is the one. To exactly. Work. So when you tell us that because of the person involved, then the people are justified in suspecting that you are indeed in the process of doing what you usually do. Don't forget, this is not the first public official matter which has come, I mean, public official who has been involved in anything that people suspect there will be a crime, what has come of any of, the, or no, any of them? No real outcome to what people expect. So when you go again and you ask for the docket, then the people are entitled by way of memory and a common experience that, no, perhaps we are heading towards that direction that we know of. Okay. So that's, that's just a concern you want to raise. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> let, let me have Dr. Perby. Yes, Dr. Perby, uh, from where you sit, uh, you may want to ignore the lawyers and their legalese. <laughs> and then let's hear from you. But it was deliberate to have the two speak first, particularly the Deputy Attorney General also, because we're in a, a place where particularly the media, oftentimes there's too much, you know, if you like, sensationalism and non-fact being turned into fact for a discussion. Yes, Dr. Perby. Yes, uh, again, thank you for having me here. And, and it's, I love your approach because it created the legal framework uh, for us to have the discussion, which is important. Uh, but I also like to say that a lot of times in this country, sometimes we let the technicalities uh, overrun uh, morality, ethics, integrity, and maybe even common sense. And so I appreciate the legal framework and, and, and particularly justice. I love how you said the police, for example, were looking at a case of stealing. Because as an ordinary citizen, the first thing, one of the first things that came to mind was, oh, the police were reported to that over a million dollars have been stolen and they went after these people, these house helps. Didn't it cross their minds? Why would an individual have a hundred million dollars in their home? Right? <laughs> that's, that's for me. You know, a common, the, the common citizen's question. But now what you're saying is that, well, legally the police are looking at somebody has stolen somebody's property. But, well, then that brings in the OSP's uh, investigation. Why should a public officer have a million dollars sitting in their home? And that is why I say that this is not just legality. There are issues of morality and ethics involved. In fact, 
There even are issues of optics, just optics. When you are a public officer, you, you know, you, you are held up to a higher moral standard, an ethical standard than everybody else. You know, so it is when you are a teacher. In fact, the scriptures say that not, not many of us should be teachers because teachers will be held, will be judged with stricter rules because we are supposed to know better. So that's where I am coming from, right? Why will a public officer have a million dollars, whether it's for their uncle, whether it's for their brother, whether it's for the mother at home? And why will this not raise alarm bells to a police? Is it normal that people keep a million dollars in the, on, the, on, the, on them? Um, is it normal for the police that they've seen that public officers stash money? And, and, and one of my concerns is, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking as an ordinary citizen because during the currency crunch, U.S. dollar crisis in our country. <laughs> I was told by individuals of ministers who come and change millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars. I couldn't believe it. Maybe I'm naive. So is it that some people know that it is quite normal that public officers will have lots of cash on them? And indeed, we've seen cases where you know, ministers and parliamentarians have lost money. They went to wash a car. Somebody stole 25000 You know, so it has it become normal to the police so that it hasn't raised a bell? That is problematic. The other thing that worries me about this case is the very prejudicial statement the president made, and people have called him a clearing agent, right? Literally say, I am confident that you'll be fine. Nothing will. Why on earth? Will the president make such a statement? He's supposed to know better than you. you. You have more information than you have on the case. That is his minister. Before the minister resigns, they would have had conversations. So he believes the minister's story. What's wrong with that? Why then go even for the docket? What, the, what, what is the deputy? What, what, let, Samson, let, let me tell you that <laughs> people are calling the president a clearing agent, all right? And so... One wonders why, again, and I have some finance, I've done some financial advisory things. We, we raise red flags when it comes to money laundering, anything more than $10,000 and things like that. And um, one of the things that came to mind was, if the president is acting like a clearing agent, in quotes, is it because this minister is a cleaning agent? Is it that this whole sanitation thing is not what we think? Is she sanitizing monies for the government? I'm really disappointed that a president who is a father of all of us will not hold his horses and say that, oh, yes, you're hardworking, and, 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 and this, is a, this is an accomplished woman, right? And, and we trust that due process will be followed. And you can even say, I hope you will be exonerated. That's very different from saying you are confident that you know the end of the matter, prophetically, prejudicially. I, I, I get very worried about that. Mm. But one last thing. Mm. Just, just, just a, okay. small, a small bit about the, the connotations you, you think yes. about uh, sanitation. Yes. Um, many years ago, I was moderating a World Bank-sponsored program on this extractive uh, sector. And... Um, one of the, you know, foreigners, you know, I don't know if he's an American or Britain, he approached me. The way the discussion had gone, he approached me and asked me, he asked, is, is in Ghana, is sanitation, you know, uh, he said, is it a synonym or something for corruption? Please go on. <laughs> well, that's what it seemed like. Mm. Because if you ask me, seems like she's sanitizing monies or washing monies, laundering, um, which should not be the case. Again, it shows how low trust is in society. And, and, and the good lawyer mentioned that. You know, leadership is, the foundation of all leadership is trust. And so once the trust is eroded, leadership is gone. And that is why people are concerned. Why is that attorney general calling for the docket? Because there's no trust. Why would there be trust when the president has already cleared somebody who is yet to be investigated? I am worried that we are playing with leadership and the high calling that it is.
Mm. Even for the minister herself to have gone after these two people or, or, or these house helps, did she not realize it was, it was almost like you are running naked after someone because you were the bathroom and they came for your stuff? Well, that's part, of the, that's, that's that's part, of, the, that's part of the argument in her favor uh, by those who argue that if it was money that she could not justify, she would have kept quiet. I, I wish we could say that because on the other hand, what it could also mean is that if there is any wrong, wrong, wrongdoing, then maybe her cup is full. Okay. But that is why I'm saying it is, it is, it, there is a normalization. Mm, mm. And some people have come out to justify why anybody will have a million dollars. I said a million dollars is nothing. You can just go around the street and pick it up. Mm. No, no, no. People okay. have also wondered, could this money, you know, you heard uh, you guys transmitted live uh, Yawan Sarko's lecture during the week. Hmm. I was surprised about 10% of our populace is somehow connected to the Galamse value chain. Right? People are also wondering, is this, is this Galamse money? The, the, the question is, why was this money not in the back? What did this minister not know? As educated as she is and her husband, what was she afraid of? Okay. Why was this money not back? Thank you, Dr. Alpebi. Let me come to uh, Dr. Richmond uh, Achiahine. Uh, and, um, okay, I'd rather not, you know, <laughs> elevate that. B people have been, you know, raising all sorts of questions, you know, about her moving forward and making the complaint. Well, some say that's rather to justify that it's clean money, nothing. Some say, well, her cup of, was full and this was God and that was her money. She cannot claim it's not hers. Yes, yeah, so, look, having followed the discussion so far and the facts as have come out so far from where you sit what do you say about it thank you very and, much uh, dr pebby refers to the time when the government was calling on all of us particularly those of us who were who sit on shows like this mm. were being pleaded with to tell the public not to hoard uh you know the black market was being blamed and so on everybody was being told not to hoard money. But the facts remain. I know just too many people mm. who didn't make any qualms about picking whatever money persuade they have in the bank and converting it into dollars and keeping it in, under their bed. Thank you very much. I think I'll first want to Dr. Strem for what he said. You know, and from what the last speaker just said, I mean, the docket's being called by the AG. And from the experiences, like Dr. Srem said, creates suspicion. That is why everybody is worried. That is why everybody is worried that why didn't we allow it to go the way it was going? And suddenly we have one leg from OSP, the second leg with the AG. And the more importantly, what makes it more dangerous is that this is a politically exposed person. And how, as you said, how can one of them be able to assess objectively about the person. So the anxiety that is being created, the suspense that is created is coming from the way it's being handled. Because like you I rightly said, initially, they should have had this pre-advice to the police to do it this way. Then they, they've done it this way and it has fallen to the public domain. If the police didn't bring it to their attention, what yeah. could they do? Well, and if the attorney general says, I give you power to prosecute, I just want to help you with the matter of the criminal uh, theft, prosecuting the people accused of theft. OSP is doing a completely different thing. OSP's focus is on the minister and her husband or the, the family. And the What's wrong with that? The reason why people are not happy about it is that he's one of them. I mean, we have to be very clear that if we are in the same boat and something is going wrong, could I speak objectively about it? You know, let us be Ghanaians, like morally, and ethically, let us begin to think rationally. Not everything is by law. I think, what sort of country is this? Are we being ruled by law? Hello? The moral and the ethics are very, very important. That is why we find people hooking people's neck, trying so, to... So what's the suspicion? The, sus the criminal prosecution going on. The AG will get involved and do what? Get the money that they want to retrieve for the woman re uh, uh, reduced? Or what? To her disadvantage? Not to her disadvantage or her advantage. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that institutions that have been created are not independent. 
Let us make it clear here. Are they are the AG? Is it independent? You see, AG is not independent. It's not we independent. Know that. No, but the question I'm asking: What's the fear about the AG's involvement in the aspect of the theft, which is against the individuals who stole the money? The, the, the fear is that it has happened, like Dr. Strim said, and what has been the outcome? The fear is that we have seen it before, and we will see it again. So why do we want to do these things as if we are all trying to do one thing or the other? So that is my take on it. But like the question you said, <laughs> is it a cup full? You know, when the crisis started coming, and the dollar started running 15, I had so many people telling me, Asking me for my advice. They ask me, Doc, what do you think about this economy? The first thing I ask you, if you destroy somebody's asset in your custody, do you expect other people to have the asset and give it in your custody? What I'm trying to say that the bonds that were destroyed, it is people money that's been entrusted to you. And you have consistently and deliberately destroyed a value of 90. Deliberately? Well, I would call it, because those of us in finance, if I have a return of 19.3 for five years consistently, and you spread it for 15 years with a drop rate of 8.5, the value is completely lost. But where's the deliberateness? Because we are in a difficulty. No, Craig, now who calls them? In your, your opening speech, I like your take. You said, now who calls them? Who calls them? So, I mean, who calls them? All this borrowing and borrowing, we knew where we were going. I predicted it in 2019 at my lecture at Kempiski. I said we are heading down to the drain because the way we were borrowing, it is not commensurate with the project that is supposed to give, give us a little education here. What is the, the impact, negative effect, of not taking such amount of money to the bank? And keeping it at home. The negative impact is straightforward, Sammy. You are de depriving the, the surplus end of the money to the deficit end. What we mean is that the banks will receive this money and will give it to loans so that the economy will grow. But if you do that, if you don't do that and somebody holds on it, that money is being withheld. That is why you move the money from the surplus area to deficit area through the financial system. Again, I mean, when they say they are monitoring M1, M2, the, the measure of money, money supply, M1, M2. They cannot measure it. But the quantum of the money is sitting somewhere where nobody even has to control. It doesn't work. Mm. What about inflation? It is not, you, that is where they did. You see, immediately they saw the currency the, 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 the going down. They pumped in the money. They bought the dollar. So the dollar started going to 15. So even this hiding this money has something to do with the pricing of the currency. And these things have ramification effect and the negative effect on the economy. So when people say inflation, what do you ask? Why do we talk about that? We talk about it because it erodes the purchasing power of the Ghanaian. Mm. That is why we are more concerned. But let me come to I mean, let me come to the point. I that, said that, you, that that though is a moral, ethical, and not a criminal no not at all as uh, justice had mentioned earlier. Yes, at all yeah at all it's not i mean hold, and i think dr Pebby also uh, yeah mentioned holding on to the money for me to me i mean a rational human being when you have a bad economy inflation running depreciation going here physical deficit running as helter scatter the best that you have to take a position and ideally people would buy the foreign currency keep it or they will alternatively if the property market was good, they would go into properties. In Nigeria, we are told that there's about $3 trillion in the economy, uh, uh, but, but less than 20% is in the banks. People are holding it. Holding there's it. no crime. Yeah, there's no crime. <laughs> Let me just uh, chip in this. I think we need to be very you know, careful how we even say that there is no crime in keeping, in keeping the money. money at home. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It may be true that we don't have a particular law which says don't keep so so and so money at home. But you cannot keep that amount of money at home without committing some crimes along mm. the way. For example, in April 2022, which is around the same time that these monies were probably being accumulated, mm. the Bank of Ghana published a notice, notice number BGGOV SEC 2022-04. 
And in that notice, Bank of Ghana recounted its previous notices in 2012 and 2019, reminding the public that you do not deal in foreign, foreign currency. currency. What, does it, what, what do we mean by dealing in for, foreign currency? It says if you buy it, if you store it, if you, a list of things that you mm -hmm. do. So even though there is no law which says that, don't keep this. Please, can you of, check that again? If you buy it, if you store it. Hold on, let me just. <laughs> let me just <laughs> that, read that's in. interesting. Let me uh, just read in. So it says, yeah, I'll come in. and this is, it says what? Please tell us again, what are you reading? I'm Bank reading from notice. Bank of Ghana notices, <laughs> which is actually from Act 723. Mm. You know, and these notices are kind of laws. Yeah, yeah. yeah. According That's to the they are laws. They are laws. laws. Yeah. yeah. So it says it actually quotes section three of um, Act seven two three. That is mm. the Foreign Exchange Act, and it says a person shall not engage in the business of dealing in foreign currency, foreign exchange, without the licenses issued under this Act. Then the business of dealing in foreign exchange includes purchase and sale of foreign currency. Receipt or payment of foreign currency, importation, exportation of foreign currency, lending and borrowing. So you ask yourself, how did you come by, by this volume of foreign currency? But this is like the forex kind of business, people who are dealing with. No, no. It, you can go for, if you, no, if you go for license, then you are, you are <laughs> authorized to do so. Any person, whether an institution or whatever, who does not go for a license and is yet dealing with this amount of foreign currency, must be must be committing some must be breaching some laws. That is not all. Even if it is put in a box and locked and kept. <laughs> How did it get into the box? That is the question. You know, something you remember there was an instance, it was a case where the law was that you shouldn't be found in the vicinity of the Queen's uh, uh, airstrip. And the person crossed into the center. When he was arrested, he said, I'm not guilty. I was found at the center. So I was not I found at the and they asked him, How did you get to the center? <laughs> so the question is, yeah. how did you get this amount of money mm. and lock that in the, in the box. You couldn't get it without doing any of these things because we don't, we don't print okay. dollars. Let me finish something, just mm. a minute. Mm. We don't print dollars in this country. Mm. And we know how much dollar you can carry in cash into this country. Mm. Mm. It cannot be more than $10,000, right. mm. whether you are taking it out or So you ask yourself, how many $10,000 do you have in $1 million, you know, United States dollars? That's a lot of money. So we shouldn't just simplify it by mm -hmm. saying that because mm -hmm. there is no specific mm -hmm. law which says you can't hold the money. But there are laws which prevent you from accumulating that kind of money and keeping them at home. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Samson, thank you for that. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me go to Mary. And uh, I, I will plead with um, Amache in, in Sofo because you are going to do a very good job for us on this leg of the discussion on the broader matters of, you know, uh, governance and protecting our economy and the rest of them. Um, so, uh, Mary, maybe we should get into that uh, straight away. Mary, you at the GII have issued a statement, and in that statement, um, you you are you are unhappy about what is going on. Uh, you feel this shouldn't have happened, but it is going on. So the OSP uh, should do its work and do it well among others, and then you zoom into the conduct of public officers bill, which should be passed um, in a form and fashion that can check some of these uh, things. That, that's your concern. Certainly. Let me say good morning to you and good morning to my fellow uh, guests on your show this morning and to those who are watching us. Yes, something we say so because we believe that in this country we can make some very good strides if we have laws that um, are back. We make the call that the best place to start with the investigation is the office of the special prosecutor because he is supposed to be dealing in issues of um, investigating corruption and corruption related offenses. We believe this zooms into that arena. And so that's why we are saying that without a doubt, the Office of the Special Prosecutor has over the past year shown that if he is given the needed independence, if he is allowed to do his work, he would do a good job. He has done that over and over again, started with the DCE, he has gone on to Fempon Boate. Uh, who many people did not expect to have happened. Mm. He's done so. So we believe he can also tackle this. It is, uh, if he wants to, he will do that. And we think he should do it 
and do it expeditiously. Right. We also believe that one of the things that can help the course of this investigation is to see the various agencies collaborating, particularly the police, to give them the original information to ensure that they are engaging and doing the investigation as they should. It is a sad matter, but uh, it is what it is. So let us see the appropriate office doing its work and doing its work. Then this calls to attention the fact that over the past 10 years, we have been asking for a robust legislation or framework that deals with the matter of asset declaration. As per what the constitution talks about, the constitution says people who take political office would be required to ensure that they declare their assets even before taking office and also uh, three months after they've done so. Somehow in the passage of the law to activate that clause in the constitution, we see that there is a six month period given. Mm. However, uh, that is uh, being tackled by the COPO, I mean the conduct of public officers bill, which has traversed uh, about three different parliaments mm. and has not gotten passed. At the last count, we know for a fact that it went through even the second reading. However, uh, government chickened at the last minute and they didn't pass it. We also know that, as a matter of fact, cabinets which the bill has been with during this tenure of parliament, at a point decided that it was not a priority for government to pass that bill. That is very curious. And we should be asking government why a bill that seeks to ensure that we are building on and making robust act 550 uh, 1998 we are uh, uh, aiming to make it a best practice bill become a reality the government which promised in its manifesto that it would fight corruption and ensure that some of these legislations are passed decided not to do so and if you look at the chronicles from the uh, occupy ghana uh, with the very confidential letter that came out. It, it is a sad reflection of the fight against corruption being rhetoric more than the action we require. Mm. However, we are consoled in the fact that, despite the fact that civil society and other actors have failed in getting government to make this a priority, the IMF in one of its requirements has demanded that we ensure that we pass this bill. Because it does more than what uh, the Act 550 does. We are calling for an asset declaration regime that is robust enough to add on the issues of verification. Apart from verifying, let me admit here that the Auditor General in the various meetings we have held with him in the past year as the Citizens Coalition has indicated to us that every asset that is declared, they open to ensure that the form is well filled. That is the case. As to whether they verify on the asset that have declared and the various liabilities therein, is another matter we need to all pay attention to. Mm. So we are asking that this COPO bill that is currently stranded in parliament should become an urgent matter that the state pays attention to. And now that the IMF has come in, we know that it must come out. And we want a regime that has verification and a regime that has publication. Again, let me reference uh, when we were even in a dictatorial regime during the PNDC era. If you go back to the government gazettes that chronicle that period, you would see that we had an asset declaration regime that took care of verification and also publication. And so public officers' assets were published. So you begin to wonder what went wrong with us that if in the 80s, we were able to look at an asset declaration regime that took care of this, which others came to learn from us to adapt their own, then where there 
lies the fact that in a democracy we decided that we make things so cheap that people just declare their assets until there is an issue before these assets are looked into okay remember we are talking about public offices right apart from verification we want to also see the issue of the publication mm. and then finally monitoring of these assets and liabilities we are all in this country and we remember that people who are just like me who cannot account for maybe a thousand cities at any particular time become public officers and within a year or two they are building mansions right. they are quite very expensive right. so uh, building property. mansions and the rest of them you say that in your statement that the osp should investigate um, extensively to so that we get to know all of these things the osp um, issued a statement and said it is its investigations are ongoing uh, supposing at the right time because i can imagine that they will be inundated by the media and as you saw in in your short um, any serious media house in the time that the discussions were going on, if you are a serious media house, you have reporters at OSP's uh, building area, and as we understand, they went there, they were driven away, so they had to stand around. They didn't move away. Some of them were just lurking around the place, even though they were driven away from the OSP site. Uh, Madame Cecilia Dapé's house. You, you, are, you must be a lousy editor if you don't send a reporter to, to be stationed at that house. So they were all there, and as these movements were going on, you can see they were only capturing pictures because they couldn't get anybody to talk to them. And uh, they did searches, as we understand, as expected to have been done and so on. So on this note, what I'll say, even before I go to my next guest, is that Ghanaians, the OSP is investigating. What is your role? Do you think you don't have a role in this? You have a role. Your role is this. If you know that this public officer has a property one place or the next, if you know that they have stashed some money somewhere, the OSP needs you to supply information. And guess what? If you do it rightly, you benefit. In fact, those who are stealing the money in the house, you don't have to steal. When you suspect that the money is tainted money, you don't have to steal it. All you need to do is blow the whistle under the Whistleblowers Act. Section 24 says you are entitled to as much as 10%. So imagine uh, Mahabina, <laughs> Patience uh, Boche. If you saw this and you felt the money is not clean money and you wanted part of it desperately or you want to help the state, to stop something you thought was thievery, all you needed to do was go through the Whistleblowers Act. Blow the whistle. You blow the whistle, and then the state will recover what does not belong to her, and you get 10% of the money. You spend it freely. Nobody will prosecute you because that's your money. You actually get protection from the state. And uh, the state could use you as a witness, and you also have a protection as a witness, okay? Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Everyone is laughing because uh, the trust in all these institutions is lacking. And the fear is that if I go, I may be sacked without any 10% and nobody will be found out. Oh, you get a lawyer. They will, they will, they will help you out. <laughs> they will help you out. Isn't, isn't that so? There's no trust in the, in the, in the system. Mm. I think that is the issue. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just opened that act. Um, it says you can blow the whistle. This is these are the classes of people you can blow the whistle to. Um, okay. Uh, you can blow it to. You can blow it to. Uh, a police officer, the attorney general, the auditor general. <laughs> if you don't trust the police officer. You can trust some police officers. You can blow it to the attorney general. You can blow it to the auditor general. You can blow it to a staff of an in, the intelligence agencies. Okay? <laughs> a member of parliament. You can blow it to the serious fraud office, now IOKO. You can blow it to the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice, National Media Commission, the Narcotics Control Board. You can blow it to a chief, uh, head, of, head or an elder of the family 
you know, of the whistleblower. So you can tell a head or elder of your family and they will help you to get you to the right place. It says a head of a recognized religious body. You can talk to your pastor about it okay. and then they will take it up. A member of the district assembly, a minister of state, uh, <laughs> the office of the president. You see, everyone here is just <laughs> laughing. Office of the president, the revenue agencies, okay, governing board, or a district chief executive. You can blow it, and when you blow the whistle, you will be protected. If your somebody wants to harm you, if you are an employee, you will not be dismissed. You cannot be suspended, and they cannot do anything to you. And then when the process is over, it says that you are entitled to. Section 24, reward on recovery of money. A whistleblower whose disclosure results in the recovery of an amount of money shall be rewarded from a fund that is supposed to, well, the fund has not been set up. That's a next So thing. you see? With 10% of the amount of money recovered or the amount of money that the Attorney General shall, in consultation with the Inspector General of Police, determine. All right, thank you very much. <laughs> now, let, let me now go to... Um, uh, we're going to Mr. Amechi uh, in Sefo, uh, in Sefo Amechi. Now, he uh, has an expertise that is very useful to us. And then we'll, we'll continue to look at the, whistle, uh, the conduct of public um, officers' uh, bill. But Amechi in Sefo is a cross-border asset recovery expert. Mm. What does he see? Um, what do we do? There are questions of money laundering being raised. What is it? <clears throat> there are questions of the lifestyle audit that the OSP is doing. What is involved in the lifestyle audit? Ms. Ansofa, let's hear you. Thank you very much for, for having me. Good, good morning, every, everybody. Mm. Um, I think one of the first things I have to say that I, I have observed is a high level of confusion um, and matters and issues that are being conflated. Um, it almost seems as if there's a lot of um, distraction taking place. Um, you know, dead person and somebody about to know their dead person and somebody else inherits it, etc. We just need to strip all of that back and keep it very, very simple. Um, the police should um, investigate the crime that has been reported, the alleged crime that has been reported to them, and the OSB should be allowed to um, investigate the alleged um, corruption uh, that uh, is evidence here. Now, Mary has already um, stated why the OSB is the right office to uh, investigate the um, alleged um, corruption, so I'm not going to go back into um, into those points. But what I wanted to say um, is that strong institutions are the framework and the backbone of good governance. So you were asking earlier, um, what should um, the citizens do? What should the people do? Um, the people need to ensure um, and insist that strong institutions like the OSB's uh, uh, office uh, exist and are carrying out their functions without any uh, barriers being placed uh, in, in their way. So having said that, um, on the question of money laundering and lifestyle audits, um, it is also important for people to educate themselves on these things so they can set the expectations um, that you expect to see from your um, public officials. Um, money laundering is really um, a process by which dirty money gets washed and um, gets um, reinvented into a legitimate um, money, to seem like legitimate money. And there are three phases of money laundering, or three stages. Um, the first one is placement, where the cash is introduced uh, into um, the banking system. Um, the second stage is layering, where that cash is then um, converted through a series of transactions to disguise where the original source is. And then the final stage is integration, um, where that cash is then taken back out as clean money and then reinvested 
by the um, by the criminal. Um, so those three phases are the phases of, of, of money laundering. So in this case that we're discussing today, um, you know, money laundering has not taken place because um, the full um, phase or stages of money laundering has not occurred. Um, but it could be um, the case that money laundering was in the stage of or in the early stages of, uh, of taking place. So let's move on to lifestyle um, audits. What is an audit, first of all? Mm. Um, an audit is a, uh, uh, an examination, an independent examination of uh, financial information to spot any discrepancies, which will then be reported and addressed. A lifestyle audit is a forensic examination um, of the lifestyle of public officials. And after that forensic examination of that lifestyle of the public official has taken place, the results are then compared to the income stream that those public officials have um, benefited from. So what lifestyle are they leading? What income um, do, they, uh, do they generate? And so, if there's a mismatch, yeah. How, how do you arrive? How do you arrive at that, knowing the the person's lifestyle to compare with the income that may be sitting in their name in their bank account or whatever? Yeah, I, I mean uh, the, the lifestyle part of it, I have to say, is the more is the more difficult part because income is um, is income. It's how much you earn. You can check tax returns, and public documents, etc. The lifestyle part of it, I think, will come from. Um, you know, observations as to um, the, the assets that the individual um, owns, and the spending patterns um, of the uh, of the individual. And luckily, in, in Ghana, uh, you know, uh, th th there is the availability of um, uh, multiple whistleblowing uh, uh, sources and, and mediums, as you just went through uh, earlier. So, whistleblowing will also form part of um, of that lifestyle. Um, audits. So there are various um, information or data points um, that would, uh, you know, complete that picture as to what that lifestyle is of the uh, of the public official. And so, um, so that you know, the benefit. Yes. Yeah, so that typically, how is that whistle blowing uh, to happen? Is that what will lead to the audit, or rather, mm. when the audit is ongoing, and then uh, the audit or the auditor? Mm will ask members of the public to give information. Is that it? In the public office, there, there, there are two, there are two um, options here, two paths. Um, the first one is that there should be a standard routine um, lifestyle audit that takes place of um, all um, public um, officials from time to time. Um, obviously, resources will dictate uh, that it cannot happen too, uh, too often, but it needs to happen periodically. And then secondly, it also has to happen when uh, there's evidence um, that people, uh, public officials, are living beyond um, their means, either by what you can see um, or what gets reported um, through, uh, through whistleblowing. Mm. Interesting. Just, just hold on quickly for me. Let me go. Uh, 2013, I sat on this show and um, I hosted a similar discussion because somebody you know had been taped recorded secretly and it went public a minister and uh, in the conversation that she was taped she was hoping that she could make a million dollars you know so we all interpreted what she said at the time and then there were these very genuine you know uh comments by members of the opposition at the time. Um, and then one of my favorite, uh, Kweku Bako at the time, saying, this is how to look at the public officer and then be able to tell if they are doing something wrong. So let's listen to Esla Owusu-Ekufo, the communications minister now, uh, then was in opposition, and then uh, Kweku Bako Jr., who also gave us uh, some insight into public officers and their earnings and what they can or cannot claim to own. 
you're talking about somebody a million dollars isn't pocket change let's not lose sight of the fact why would anybody even mention that a million dollars it means she has a sight set on something to cushion not just her personal life but to secure her political future going forward because that's the justification that she gave being able to control others so it is not something that we can merely um, wish away or excuse and I think that for starters somebody should be checking her bank balance and and uh, to see if she's made some headway towards acquiring that uh, war chest and is well on the way to to meeting that uh, I think that for starters and I've said that in other words, we need to start with a lifestyle audit we need to start with a lifestyle audit of our people in in, in positions of authority mm. You heard President Mill saying that if SEPs officials are able to build house, a house in three years, then it means they are corrupt. What about government officials whose only official source of income is their salary, acquiring property in three, four years? Isn't that worth investigating? But the thing that Professor Mill spoke about, and God bless his soul, uh, we know them, we just play ostrich, don't we? That is why I'm saying that we shouldn't just pay lip service to it and say things that we want people to hear. But we should move beyond that and start with a lifestyle audit of our people in positions of authority. I don't know the perception out there that there are some people who use politics as a shortcut to growing or creating wealth for themselves. So when you make such statements, the tendency is for people to assume that you are thinking or you know, about to commit some corrupt practice. You can't be in politics, look at your level of incomes, all the things put together and make a million dollars not even 10 years you can't based on our scale unless you do something unconventional so to be honest with you it's inexcusable right so um i imagine so far uh, we had asla saying a minister's source of income is their salary perhaps you add allowances and she's right. Our constitution says in Article 78, Clause 3, that a minister of state shall not hold any other office of profit or emolument, whether private or public, and whether directly or indirectly. There's a caveat. Unless otherwise permitted by the Speaker, Speaker of Parliament, acting on the recommendation of a committee of parliament on the ground that holding that office will not prejudice the work of a minister and that no conflict of interest arises or would arise as a result of the minister holding that public office. Our president, who, uh, Professor Tamils, had gone to the port and was blunt about the fact that the officers there could not just get a job and within four years they were building mansions unless they were involved in some dubious means. Esla says if you are earning just your salary and things, you can't get a, you can't be doing these things within four years. Kwekubako actually placed it in a certain you know, category. He said depending on how much a minister earns and from what he knows, and he has a lot of experience under his belt, 10 years, you can't make a million dollars as a minister of state. He says, unless you are using some extra, you know, unlawful means. So my question is, how should the lifestyle audit be done? Should it happen only when somebody has blown the whistle or once we know that these are our public offices, we should have a system that does the lifestyle audit regularly. Yes. Um, there are various um, checks and uh, there are various checks and, and balances that need to be in place. It's not a um, uh, you know a silver bullet by any any means of the. Uh, of the imagination. Um, a lifestyle audit cannot exist on its own and solve all the problems that we're dealing with here. What needs to happen is you need to have, first of all, an asset declaration regime, as Mary spoke about earlier. That needs to be enforced. 
And secondly, you need to have an effective whistleblowing um, regime that also needs to be enforced. Um, and then on a periodic basis, public officials need to be subjected to a lifestyle audit that needs to be enshrined in law. And then the other thing that needs to be enshrined in law is um, an unexplained uh, wealth order um, type of um, confiscation approach. Now, in the United Kingdom, for example, anybody who owns property, I think the figure is in excess of $50,000 um, and cannot explain when asked to do so, how they acquired or they could afford to acquire that property will have that property seized from them following a court process. Um, that process or that kind of uh, law needs to be something that we, we look at in, um, you know, in, in, in Ghana, if you're going to prevent people from living beyond, um, beyond their means and um, going through four years of public service and all of a sudden acquiring a lot of wealth. Come to a court of law um, and explain uh, to the OSB how you managed to acquire uh, you know, $1 million or $2 million after four or five years when your income is less than $100,000 over those four or five years. Mm. Uh, you should be able to prove it. In, so in, in the case of in the case of this minister, presently, by the uh, Professor Ntiamwa report, she's supposed to be earning about thirty thousand two hundred or so uh, as her salary. But there could be some allowances and so on. Um, so <laughs> I don't know. They, as we understand, so what would the OSP do? The OSP will give her her family pieces of paper to write to indicate what properties they own and things, how much money they have in which bank and so on, and then try to now run a check to confirm whether you can own that money or not. Is that it? Yeah. I think the first stage is for the OSB to establish what the wealth is here. And frankly, the wealth could be far more um, than the million dollars, for example. There might be properties and other aspects of assets, which will obviously all combine to be in excess of a million dollars. Um, but secondly, um, the OSB um, needs to also uh, find out what wealth um, associates, family members, connected parties, etc., to this individual or to a public official um, have accumulated um, over a period of time. And then that is going to be compared to the um, income that those people um, generated mm. um, in, um, in, in that period of time. I mean, $30,000 um, is not a lot, of, um, a lot of money in the grand scheme of things when you're looking at the, at mm. the size of the wealth. No, I, I, when, I, when I said 30000 I meant Ghana cities, not dollars. Oh, Ghana cities. Mm. Mm. Okay. Okay. 30000 Ghana cities. And then to, to accumulate a million dollars from that, from, from that it's a... Uh, it's a massive, um, it's, it's a massive stretch. Um, but this, this, this um, investigation of this uh, uh, audits by um, the OSB will need to be forensic in nature. And what do I mean by, by, by forensic? I mean, you know, there, there's technology out there, you know, blockchain um, technology. Um, there, there are other um, technologies that can be used to trace um, funds um, and to investigate and make inquiries into um, the asset position um, of, um, of, of individuals. So, you, you know, in, in, in this day and age, you need to be operating um, at that level. Uh, and why, why, why did I mention that? Because, quite simply, the office of OSB needs to be properly funded for the OSB to be able to discharge its duties, just due to the nature of um, crimes that have been investigated right. and manner in which those crimes need to be investigated. That is critical. All right. Uh, can't thank you enough. Uh, Amechi uh, Insofo is cross-border asset recovery expert. We thank you so very much for agreeing to speak to us and educate us uh, a bit about uh, these matters. Thank you so very much indeed. So uh, he'll take leave of us, but we'll continue our discussion. I want to do uh, something. We go to um, 
the, do we go to the deputy AG so that he can also mm -hmm. take leave of us and then we will return uh, to continue our discussion. Um, uh, Mr. Chair Yabua, the question about the conduct of public officers bill. I'm sure you have read the Occupy Ghana uh, statement chronicling and last week I was here to talk about how I can't believe that Occupy Ghana is not even tired. Uh, chronicling how they have, you know, since when? Uh, they have chronicled and showed that since uh, when they started following up on the process, uh, 29th of May 2022, then they wrote 24th of August 2022, 31st August 2022, 1st September, uh, 5th September 2022, 17th October, January 2023, they were still chasing it, you know. February, they were still chasing. Um, February, they did about three or four different uh, attempts. 30th of May, they were still on it. 16th of June, uh, they were still on it until, you know, the... The, the, the government indicated to them that uh, they had gotten to a point where they felt that uh, what is already in existence is sufficient, which also actually runs counter to what uh, your office did. On the 19th of July, 2021, you called the you know, stakeholders together, civil society organizations, you called them together. And let me show you something here. The Attorney General on that day uh, made this statement. He said, our nation has been in desperate need of a comprehensive body of ethics to regulate the conduct of men and women vested with public trust. It is correct to say that unethical behavior in public office has been a major cause of political instability in Ghana. Such conduct has been pervasive throughout Ghana's political and administrative system since independence, 19. Uh, 57. He said, uh, it is to this urgent need that the conduct of public officers bill 2021, of, of course, later May 2022, seeks to respond. The conduct of public officers bill is to give a more consequential effect to chapter 24 of the 1992 constitution on the matters of the conduct of public officers. So, he was very emphatic about it and how it will help. He ended up by saying that the bill seeks to address matters relating to including sexual harassment and provide a gamut of stringent administrative measures and sanctions to deal with violations of the law, ranging from a bar against holding public office to penal measures. Then later we heard that the government was not interested, even though the Attorney General, your office, submitted a memorandum to Cabinet for that purpose, I think in April of, of this year, right? So what's going on? Afred Chua okay, uh, of course, he must have been on the line for too long, uh, so we lost him on that note. Um, I wanted to get him done with so we take a break and return with a, a smaller number so we can have a, a fluid sort of interaction up and down all right um, at this juncture let me take a break we'll be right back you're welcome back this is news file is your most authoritative news analysis platform and here on news file we put ghana first and uh, some of your comments here, um, Usman Abbas says, our corruption fight is a mirage and mere rhetoric. The politicos will never fight it. The presidency is steering freakish looting uh, of public coffers at its behest, absent prosecution. Cecilia's inquiry would remain unresolved like other corruption cases in the country. Uh, as a citizen, you have a role. So if you let this pass, nothing will happen. Then you too, you blame yourself. That's why I did what I did. Now who caused him? Ni a fote kwe. After all is said and done, all will be said, but nothing will be done. 
guys, we can do better than this. <laughs> Said them, Badasu, as long as it's President Akofuado who always clears any wrongdoing before any meaningful investigations begin, I don't have any um, replica of hope in any state institution in his dispensation to do anything above the clearance of Arant appointees. Oh, I thought so far there was so much uh, faith in the OSP at least to be able to do something for us. K. Amofa says, really? Are all politicians in Ghana ready to avail themselves of lifestyle audits today? Mm. Ama McGold says, of course, we know exactly what to do to prevent this amount of thievery, but our corrupt society won't make it priority. The OSV is conveniently being deprived of resources. Okay, that's a major issue that uh, the GII and the partners have been talking. Make sure OSV has what it, mm. it needs. Uh, this one, blue, you are blue from Ghana. It says, in this whole, Madame Cecilia, the most heartbreaking part is the president saying he looks forward to her being exonerated <laughs> before investigation even starts. And why is corruption a misdemeanor but stealing bre uh, bread to feed a second degree felony? Uh, corruption is not a misdemeanor. It's been elevated to a higher punishment, like, uh, you know, uh, what do you call it? Ah, what's the name again? Corruption is not a misdemeanor. Kwesi Kisiedu says, truly, the sums found in the minister's house is mind troubling. Sums found in the minister's house. We don't know about that yet. Mm -hmm. All we knew uh, had been said is that they have made a significant uh, finding or discovery there. That's the, what some source had uh, told some media people. Um, she, did, she did supervise the very big projects in the country. You are right about that. Okay. So um, what do you have to say about this bit of the discussion that we're bringing very quickly so that we can move on to other matters about... Uh, Asset declaration. Yes, yes. yes. I think... The beginning of all these lifestyle audit, the beginning first leg will be the asset declaration. Everybody would have to file his asset and declare how much he has. Then the question is that public officials for every three years, not four years, mm. if you make it four years, some would exit. Every three years, the OSP should be staffed, be well resourced to go and check, validate the asset declaration versus what they have. Physical verification, like if you do the, if you do the uh, customer due diligence, we do what we call verification and authentication to make sure that the asset you said you have is what we have. Mm -hmm. So they would have be, even be required to refile another one so that the OSP, well-resourced ASP, be going after these assets. Because a lot of the way that people are acquiring assets, especially foreign currencies and buildings, we need to look at it critically because it will not affect the entire economy in the years to come. Okay. Um, what do you have to say about that briefly? And hold on, let me go to the deputy AG. We have him on the line now. Uh, so the question I was asking is, why was this important bill jettisoned? Uh, of course, the facts as we know them from your outfit, you seem to have done everything that was needed. I've heard you say that you even wanted to improve the verification aspect because you didn't want to allow anybody to just bring a piece of paper. The auditor cannot open it, and then they would have named some things they would acquire in there. And then once they get into office, they acquire them, uh, and so on, through corrupt means. So why has this stalled? All right, thank you very much, Samson. Before I do that, let me quickly uh, clear this kind of um, presentation that my friend just remarked about that. It's because Madam Sadapa is a minister that I call for the docket. That is in the case. Calling for docket is a normal practice and occurrence. In the Attorney no, General. he was always saying that because you had mentioned that it's because of her stature and public interest. That's why you had to call for it. Yes. So I'm just making the point that it matters not whether the person is a public officer or not a public officer. If the Attorney General is called, uh, they need to bring their docket. 
that's appropriate. That's quite appropriate. It's not about having a military, a human military. But these are people writing letters to the Attorney General. I don't know whether Council has not done it before. That means they're going to cover a document and then review. So it's a normal occurrence, normal practice. Now to the substantive question. Yes, the corner of public access bill, as it's been discussed, is a bill that has been uh, away for quite a long time. And we are still committed to having it passed. It is considered that it has taken a long path for it to get past parliament, maybe within the term, for it to be passed. But we give the assurance that this government, and from what we have done and what I know, speaking as a deputy attorney general, that bill will definitely get passed. You said that bill will be passed? Exactly. I can assure you that. Because now the World Bank is also on your necks because uh, you had included that for, for the loan that we went for. It is in the interest of Ghanaians. It is in the interest of the fight against corruption. It is in the interest of accountability mm. to have that bill passed. Yes. So what, what, the question that is being asked by GII and its partners, Occupy Ghana and the rest of them, is it, it, must, it, must, be, it must have teeth to bite. What, why is there not uh, publication, like happens in other countries, of their declared assets? And then in Rawlings' regime, far back as Rawlings' regime, there was gazetting of the uh, declarations. So why can't that happen in, 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 in our regime? I think that should be the appropriate thing. Mm. Yeah, yeah, but, but that, is not, that is not in the current proposed bill. No, there is a section on verification. Yes. I forgot. Yes, there is a section on verification. That's correct. So in terms of the Auditor General verifying to see whether indeed I possess or own property A or B, that one should be verified. In terms of publication, it's something that we can be looking at. If at the end of the day, the bill is subject to Parliament, and there's the need for further sessions to be added, I don't think it's going to break any bone. Mm. We want to get the best law for, for, for our country, because if we want to fight corruption, we should have the laws that we can use in fighting it to, to, uh, to the hills. Otherwise, if there's any escape route, people may want to use it and then escape accountability. So if that accepts publication, it's something that the South of Ghana wants. Why not? Uh, but when it went to Parliament earlier, the parliamentarians opposed the publication on the grounds that they will be subjects of robbery and, and so on and so forth. Um, the, those who have been campaigning have been asking you the questions. Are we better than South Africa, Liberia, mm. Sao Tome, Cape Verde, are among the rest where there is both verification and publication? Yes, that's why we are represented by our MP. They represent our interests. So if in their thinking, publication is not something that Ghanaians want, that's why they vote in parliament. Hmm. So if the bill may go to parliament by subject to the approval of our members of parliament who are our representatives. Okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Afre Choyebwa. And the, the issue has been that if you don't publicize, how do I get to know so I help you when the person amasses more wealth when they get to parliament? Maybe they were renting some one bedroom somewhere. Immediately they get into public office. We have seen that they have built, you know, mansions. How do I know that this is what they declare so that I can blow the whistle to shrug more particularly for them to investigate? Yes, that, that is an issue of transparency which we need to... But before that, let me just um, correct a little uh, wrong impression. It is true that Attorney General request for dockets is normal, it's a normal practice. Mm -hmm. But it is not a normal practice for Attorney General to request for stealing dockets the way it has done. And we need to also agree that when people are raising concern about these things, it is not because they have any... It's, it's born out of experience. Now, here's the president saying that he is confident that the thing will be clear. The attorney general is an appointee of the president and he's calling for the docket. And look, if the attorney general desires to find anything, he can conduct its own investigations and leave the police to prosecute. Because, you see, when the attorney general requests for the docket, what it means is that the prosecution cannot go on until the attorney general returns the docket. So it's not just a matter of give us information. No. 
by requesting for the docket, the Attorney General is stalling the prosecution and the process, which everyone okay. was shocked to have come in. Now right. to the transparency issue mm. that you raised. Mm. It, it doesn't make a lot of progress. We, we are not making a lot of progress if we ask people to declare assets and not publish it. Because it's the publication that brings in, into light, of which brings the transparency and allows people to bring their whatever they know. So for example, if I didn't have 10 houses and I declare 10 houses with the intention of acquiring 10 houses in three years, <laughs> if it is published, there will be someone in the public who will say, look, this house, I know, I know the owner, and it's not this person. So we, we, we cannot do the work halfway. So I think that transparency is important, and I think the regime should be interested in you know, uh, 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 bringing transparency into the affairs of public thank, officials. Thank you very much. Um, let, let's uh, hear uh, from Mary takes leave of us, and then uh, Dr. Yao Pebi. Hey, Mary, quickly, you have a question for the minister? Yes, I do, something. I just wanted... From the way the minister has spoken eloquently and with confidence, I wanted him to give us some clear timelines based on which we should be expecting uh, when this bill is moving from cabinet to parliament. Again, I am asking of the minister, why would the executive leave the issue of publication to chance for parliament, which we all know is against the issue of publication and monitoring of assets. Let me quickly add that uh, in the issue of Cecilia Dapa, I just recounted that from the fourth estate's uh, inquiry into ministers who had declared their assets and those who had not, mm. uh, the Madame Cecilia Dapa was not one of those captured as not declaring her assets. Right. And so the investigation, uh, it's, it's a good call that they should be looking at her assets and we believe we would be getting a lot from there. If she has indeed declared her assets, then we do not have a challenge whatsoever okay. on ensuring that those huge sums of money uh, were indeed. Thank you. Thank you so very much for joining us. And uh, <clears throat> uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Alpebi. And th this, is, this is all that the new proposed bill is supposed to do for uh, publicity. It says the Auditor General shall publish periodically in the Gazette a daily newspaper of nationwide circulation and in the website of the Auditor General's office a list of public officers who hold an office specified in the first schedule, that is those who are supposed to declare, and who have declared their assets or have defaulted in the declaration of their assets. The publication shall be made each year on or before the 30th day of September. So they will just give you a list and tell you that Cecilia uh, Dapa has declared. That's all. They won't tell you what is in it. Yes, uh, Dr. Pebby. <laughs> Hello, Dr. Well, Pebby. Thank you for your patience. Yes. Uh, obviously, that is not going to solve the issue. It's, it's a good initial step, but I, 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 I align myself with those who are saying there's got to be a publishing aspect of it. Uh, the question, the, and I think it's, I mean, it doesn't make sense unless you understand that public office is public service. Why on earth would you want to come and serve me? And I want to know what you have on you as you want to come and serve me, and you say, well, I'll tell you, but you can't see it. It's in a sealed envelope. <laughs> the, our whole idea of public service is just, it's just off, which is why you played that, that video of 10 years ago with you know, a minister say, I'm here to acquire a million dollars. So if we get the spirit of it, that this is to you know, ensure that there's not a wrongful accumulation of wealth, this is ensure that the public purse is protected and all of that, no one in their right sense will say, don't publish it. If you don't want us to know your matter, then don't get into our matter. Don't come and say you want to serve as a public officer. You can keep in your private lane, you can make an impact in Ghana, not necessarily be in the public service, you can be a great architect, you can have your chambers as a lawyer, you can make your money or whatever. Nobody's coming to bother you about this. But if you say you want to serve us, we want to know who's coming and how clean your hands are. 
what they have when they came and what they left. I think it should be straightforward if we understand the import of this. Let me conclude by saying that um, this, this is issue, I hope, will, I hope we'll learn from it because we seem to be a people who don't learn, mm. right? This issue will boil for the next two, three weeks and then will just die down. But if we really learned from it, if it became a catalyst, for example, for the bill to be passed, as the deputy minister is saying, then kudos to us. The kind of disparity in wealth we are seeing in the sub-region and in this country in particular is horrific. People cannot put, can barely put body and soul together. And the public officers who are supposed to be serving them are keeping, don't forget, a million dollars was stolen. It's not a million dollars you had. Hmm. That, enough, that, in, that itself is huge enough, but that's what was stolen. Who knows what is left, all right? They say that in West Africa, the wealth inequality index is such that Guinea-Bissau leads with 50.7, Benin is next, 47.8, Ghana is third. The inequality of wealth. The wealthy are so wealthy, the poor are so poor. The optics is not good, mm. even if she was exonerated. All Leadership right. should do better than this. Right. Uh, stay with us. We go to Addis Adel to check how we are going to stop bully. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is News File. It's your most authoritative news analysis platform. And here on News File, we put Ghana first. And I guess who are in the studio and still on the line joining uh, for the next uh, discussion uh, that we're doing. Dr. Justice Strimsai is Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Law, GIMPA, and Managing Partner, Praetorium Solicitors. Uh, Dr. Yao Pebi is medical doctor, global CEO, hub, uh, the HUD group and steering committee member, the Ghana Compact. Also, we have Dr. Richmond, Etuahini corporate governance and banking consultant, Salman Partners and financial consultant. Thank you very much for your patience and staying with us. Um, on this note, I think I'd like to go to Dr. Yao Pebi to start with. Um, so, unfortunately, we will not be able to show you the video from Addis Adel. I don't know how some manage it. I can't no, look at it. No, no not for much. a minute. I can't. <laughs> and this show is brought to you by Bank of Africa, strong as a group and close as a partner. Oh, MTN everywhere you go, Ashasi University, educating ethical and entrepreneurial leaders for Africa, Robert and Sons, Subscribe Services, your comprehensive eye care service provider for 31 years, Jura Plus, how you get your water matters. Remember, where Jura Plus goes, water flows, DBS Industries, roofing, papa, pa, fie, my way. Dial 165 hash on MTN to join my way today. Good insurance. Sherry Tree Properties. We develop spaces as though we were going to occupy them ourselves. Syntex tanks. It's strong and it's tough. Flamingo paints. Simply superior. Right. So, um, Dr. Pebby, from what you have... Um, seen and come to know about the development in uh, Addis Adel, which we know is not peculiar to Addis Adel, but that this one has come public. Um, what should we be doing as a nation? Hmm. That's a good question, uh, Samson. Hmm. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that, I, I don't know if my dad is listening, but he's an Addis old boy, he's a Santa Clausian, so oh. I better be careful what I say. <laughs> he will agree with but, you, everything you say, he will agree with you. <laughs> mm. But I, I would like to submit that this is, this is a, complex, it's a complex issue. I don't think it's as simple as, oh yeah, he's a bad boy, you know, beat him up, send him to... Uh, Correctional center, etc. Let me say that I think there are three angles I like to look at the complexity of this from. Number one is what about this makes it an isolated case, right? Just an isolated case of one bad boy, you know, beating another. We don't even know what provoked it, so we can't even see how innocent the other one is either. But what about this is an isolated case? Number two, what about this is systemic? 
which you alluded to. And when I say systemic, which is an disco white problem or a boys' school problem or a secondary school issue or a, gen a general educational system issue uh, in Ghana. And then thirdly, what about this case is a microcosm of a larger Ghanaian society, right? Because, for example, we've seen issues of bullying by the state. We've seen brawn over brain in things like land guardism, right? And around the same time this thing happened, we saw footage. Another video went viral, you know, pro police brutality, if you remember. The video uh, from Dadiasi in the Seche Kubewu district of Ashanti region. In fact, the chokehold of the boy, you know, is very similar to the belt uh, this guy used to, the police used to, yeah. you know, tie the neck off. So, your, so your, your friends in the studio, when we went on the break, they were referring to that video. Ah, uh, there you go. You know, so uh, that's why I'm saying that uh, we need to look at this particular case, but also what is it reflecting, you know, on us as a, as a Ghanaian people. Mm. Then when it comes to the case itself, uh, if we are talking about how to tackle it again, to be it, it's interesting that the, the, some of the issues we have in in, the, in 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 Africa have been described recently as wicked problems. In, in other words, they are they have multiple tentacles, and, and so we need to be we need to have systemic thinking in solving them. Otherwise, you solve one part of it, and another part you know shows up. So I would say that number one, it has to be handled in terms of training issues. What is it about our formation? our training and education system that must change. What values are we inculcating? Are we inculcating values at all? Or education has just become about, like a friend of mine said, that has become education. Hmm. You know, not training the head, the heart, the hands, but just pouring knowledge into the head. Number two, what about this is sociological? Are there issues we need to deal with? Is this guy, we are even assuming he has parents. Right, you know what is the situation at home? Where, so what, where does he come from? Yeah. What, what is his socialization? Right. Number three, psychological. Is this guy? Does this guy have mental health issues? And mental issues are health issues are real, especially after the pandemic. Right. There are many of us sick, and I say this as a medical doctor, and I'm not even aware because it's not showing on the skin, it's not showing on the forehead, but we may be sick. So there may be psychological issues. That have to be dealt with the, the guy needs to be assessed about both of them both the the the, the, the guy who was doing the chokehold and the victim both need to be assessed but especially the guy who provoked it mm. number four are there spiritual issues you know and then number five legally how do we handle this because yeah. you are the lawyer you know too well this can be handled you know as mm. a civil a civil case so so legally legally after the ministry of education's intervention um we know that the victim who was suspended has been brought back and we're told that he has been giving some psychological attention he's been attended to and uh getting ready to sit his exam you know they are they are classmates and mm. uh, the the perpetrator actually was uh, processed by the police he was supposed to have been put before court yesterday but there was some situation so um he would return to court sometime uh, in August, but he's been granted bail and uh, given to the custody of the headmaster. Mm, I see. And I see also see that the, head, the housemaster has been suspended as well, you know, um, re regarding the case. So it seems like we are going about it, you know, the right way in terms of legal is being taken care of, psychological has been. Let's get into the sociological aspect. Let there be social workers to look into that context as well mm. but then let's look at the broader issue of bullying in our secondary schools mm. i think that it should attract serious serious consequences and maybe this will be an a, a, unfortunately a scapegoat issue uh, that will help to stop many others that are happening the only reason why this has come to the fore mm. is that somebody recorded it that's right but so many more Just well, what, like what, 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 what do you say years. what do you say about the fact that you know somebody was recording there were others in the mm -hmm. background and they, they couldn't seem to do anything about what was happening as we understand um, um, he sees the sim card of the victim and when he demanded it he then, you know, began the assault, almost, almost killing him. Um, like I said, 
I can't watch that video. I don't want to uh, put anybody through that video, particularly if you are parents. Yeah, I mean, uh, I have a son about that age, you know, uh, and I imagine putting myself in, 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 in I mean, I, I, I wouldn't bear watching it if that were my son. But your point is, is, is well noted that who was taking the video? Why would they rather take a video than intervene? And number two, all those around seem to be rather cheering mm -hmm. or jeering, but whatever, whatever it is, they did not mm. intervene. <clears throat> and for me, that is an issue. Mm. Uh, that, that means this is quite normal, and that is worrying. I think as GES, we need to get into this and make sure that this kind of thing is expunged from a, we are, this is, this is a secondary school. Children are there to be formed, to be useful, so, uh, you know, members of society, this is not uh, a boxing arena or a wrestling ring. And I think that needs to be very clear. And let the consequences of this show that we are serious about not countenancing bullying in any form. And let's show that example as right. leaders in the society too. Mm. Um, Mary is still with us. Uh, Mary, what can you say briefly about this? Uh, the, the intervention of the GES the Ministry of Education, all, you know, uh, commendable so far. And the fact that there's opportunity, they, they are supposed to sit their exams. The oppor there's opportunity for them to sit their exams nonetheless, whilst the punitive disciplinary processes are gone into, right? Okay, uh, I understand we don't have Mary. Yes, uh, Dr. Richmond, to your hand. Yep. I think agree with the first speaker. I mean, we have a problem with this family issue. When, when we were children, we call what we call child formation and nurturing. I think the first thing we should do is to look at the backgrounds of these children, because if you have a, a family that is not together with discipline, you go to school and you tend to do that. And again, they go to school and also have peer, group, <laughs> peer groups and it's very dangerous. The way these kids form, uh, I remember one time when my daughter had to do a pharmacy. He peer group with a certain body and said they would do uh, biochemistry when he has got a degree, a time to do it. So I talk and talk and the girl didn't listen to me. So he was so much influenced by the peer group. And I think the peer group influence is very, very, very high, which we need to study it. So we need to research into it. We need to look at it. And again, the education system that we have, I think we all say is laudable. You see, we want to fund everybody, but the values, the, the values, the core values, which a country is supposed to indoctrinate. I mean, I'm told that there's no moral education. There's no this, there's no that. They replace it with social something, something, something. Yeah. But you see, if you are taught from the beginning that you, you're a human being. The other one is a human being. If you touch him, you're going to kill him. But if you go there and you learn your geography and history and economics and pass and go, you possibly go to university, graduate, and you may not be able to work with others because it's an interconnected system. And I believe that not only our education should look at this. The ministry have done well, but what I didn't understand is the house master who had to suffer. And the house masters are always away. <laughs> the husbands are sitting somewhere, mm -hmm. and the children as well. When we were in primary college, that is what happened. It, it falls to the house prefect. So I wasn't understanding why the house master, as if he knew something about it. Mm. I mean, recently, you said about it, uh, upper there, somebody threw a stone about a student, mm -hmm. hit the, head, the eye of the master. I mean, why are students, why are we breeding students like that? I mean, we need to, as a nation, like your first speaker said, a nation should take a stakeholder's talk. But like he mentioned, they will be taking inspiration from places. We have been complaining about this Ashaman situation and in the public glare, how people were being mm -hmm. whipped and, and innocent people. That is okay? why... I, Lined up and whipped. You were discussing the police officer dragging this guy on the floor in a manner that could, could have ended up killing the guy. So I think it's a societal issue that we have now. It's a broader than... There's what is reflecting, reflecting the school. I think it's bigger. And the society or the country should sit down and find a meaningful way. Because if you drag the guy down and he dies, what are you going to say? Hmm. 
I mean, he's a human being. He's not sorry to say he's not a dog. And you kill him and that's, that's it. And it goes on and on and on. We are setting commission. The, but, but on that particular issue, just is, yeah. the guy was uh, resisting arrest. <laughs> so if he's resisting arrest, the police is supposed to use uh, force, minimum, minimum force. <laughs> so why do we say children would take inspiration from that kind of thing? Yeah, so, so we, we often underestimate the effect of inequality in society. Mm. See, there is a, close, a, a, a very close correlation between violence mm. and poverty. Mm -hmm. So it is not a surprise that there is more violence in poor neighborhoods than richer neighborhoods. Now, out of inequality, results break down in law. Mm. And out of breakdown in law, you see impunity. Then, impunity is the result of the things we see. We have seen so many instances where even public, I mean, state uh, law enforcement has used pure violence, unjustifiable violence against citizens. And no one has been punished. We have seen situations where communities have, what, uh, I mean, wreaked violence to public officials, and no one has punished. Look, talk about a draw. Mm -hmm. A draw happened. We saw military men aiming yeah. at civilians. We saw a shaman, where soldiers are beating people. We, we saw what? Major Mahama. All these things were playing live on our screens, and these kids have been watching this. Mm. And not even one of these instances have we seen any form of justice, any form of punishment, any form of replication for anyone's behavior. If any at all, it delays it, so many years. It delays, yes. and there's even, when, when it delays that way, it gives people the, the impression that you can actually do it and the mm. law cannot do it. We should be doing daily trial for Major Mohammed's case. Day right? by day, mm. you know. So the point is that until we, 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 we this is not an isolated case. No. I don't believe this is an isolated case. Because even on social media, I've seen a lot of these high school violence behaviors right. all over the I mean, social media. So it's not even an isolated case. Perhaps because of the school involved, which is one of the elite schools, where you don't even expect this to happen anyway, but the second tier, third tier school, these are regular occurrences. Right. There. So I think we need to begin to show some level of... It's a long project that mm. we need to begin, but we need to begin it now. Otherwise, there will be a time where, look, you send your son to school. Mm. to go and study. Mm -hmm. Look at how difficult it is to even come by children these days. Right. Now you send, send a child to school to go and just mm -hmm. learn and come back mm -hmm. home. And then he's dead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the school will not tell you what exactly happened. Right. And everybody starts to lift about it. Look at, look at this. How can you sleep when you have a child in a boarding school mm -hmm. and knowing very well that this is what could happen to your child? And we don't care. All we do is that now everybody is trying to do what international school mm -hmm. uh, O level, whatever we are doing, all manner of things to avoid the problem and, and, and give some, you know, uh, luxury to our children. Those who can afford, but the majority of the people are in these schools, killing, I mean, harming themselves every day. Parents send their kids to school, their kids come back home and they are injured. And there's no account. Look, there have been a number of complaints from some mm. parts of the country to some of us who do this uh, private, I mean, mm. pro bono cases. And again, secondary schools. Parents are calling us every day saying that, look, I send my child to school for one, set, one term. The child comes back. Not even one of the things she took to the school hmm. is back with it. Yeah. Look, your, 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 your trunk, mm -hmm. your, your chop box. The, in fact, the chop box will not come with the... We are not even talking about... sort of a tradition mm -hmm. in the boarding school, yeah. right? You know, so it's like there's no law, there's no punishment, there's no sanction. Everybody's just doing what they like in the secondary schools and no one is take, thinking about it. And we are being told that now, too, because the numbers have, you know, mm. um, there's too much. So the control is becoming the, a The control thing. is gone. The control. Mm. I had a, an instance where a parent called me. What's the issue? The child has this uh, disease, I mean, and it's in the school. And the child has not been given any attention as far as the sickness is concerned. It's just thrown out there. And every night... The parent has to go to the school to ensure that the child is... You know, but what kind of life is this? So mm -hmm. we need to... I don't know what, what we, we, we think we are doing, but as a country, if the next generation cannot learn anything and will become basically, um, mm -hmm. right. a, a, you know, animal kingdom... Be, animal farm... Be, uh, sorry, animal kingdom behavior, jungle law, the survival of the strongest, then we are, not, we are not building any country. We are not building any country. And we need to understand that those who have been placed in position of responsibility right. should be able to take up this responsibility seriously.
All right. Thank you very much, Samson. Thank you very much. And uh, those were a brief comments about, we can't stop talking about these things. And uh, Notedria um, says that we need to look at all forms of harassment in schools, workplaces, and generally in a holistic manner. Mm -hmm. Physical assault is only one aspect. That's correct. The digital incident is not an isolated case, and that's correct. The measures are superficial responses at best. Uh, these phenomena thrive on and are fueled by a subculture with known and very disturbing characteristics. So uh, this is advice coming from the experts that we ought to take a holistic look at some of these. In the, from the latter part of last year and sometime this year, we have heard how in secondary schools, the, there's rioting, all mm. sorts of things happening, and students just doing, you know, everything, like nothing is at stake. All right, thank you very much. Now, uh, we know we don't have much time, but we can get a brief comment about this uh, call for the setting up of a national moral and integrity council mm. out of the, the Church of Pentecost uh, Convention where it invited most uh, of our big men and women to on national moral vision plan. Because they are seeing that there's too much looting in the country, there's all of these behaviors going on, and so there's a need for a national moral vision plan. But they want it to go beyond that. They are saying, let's set up a national moral and integrity council to see if we can get some help in this direction. Um, Dr. Baumia, the former president, uh, former presidents, Kofo and John Mahama were all there. But Dr. Baumia sought to suggest that there's already some plan going on to cut away some of these things. Let's hear what he had to say, and then we'll take your brief comments. We noticed some, a very, very interesting piece of data which speaks to the problems at ECG. We looked at the data, and for a period of four years or so, the revenues of ECG were virtually constant. Constant. I said, this cannot be possible. We have, we, we, how can you get more customers and your revenue is constant? And the interesting thing was that the value was virtually the same, the constant value. They didn't even take their time to change the value. So we said, no, we need to send in a team to look at the architecture of revenue collections at ECG and digitalize the process properly. So we sent in a team to ECG. They were collecting 450 million Ghana cities a month. When we sent in the team, there was sabotage. Malware was introduced into the system by people working right there. We worked through that the help of national security, and we then brought in a whole new architecture for ECG, thanks to the Minister for Energy, uh, Matthew Poku Prempa. We brought in a whole new architecture for ECG, and after this completion of this work from, from the digitalization process, 450 million a month has now increased to 1.2 billion every month. Just think about it. We are all here to consider how we deliberate on the development of our nation using moral vision. And as I've said, you don't talk morality without talking humanity. So Pentecostal Church has done well in organizing this huge meeting, and I'm sure the meeting is also being relayed across the nation. I, I wish you success. So over the next two or three days of the forum, you come up with ways and means to enable the people generally to contribute to find the way forward uh, toward developing our nation what happened to our value of being each other's, each other's uh, keeper, each his brother's keeper? 
where communal assistance to each other on our farms and in other tasks that we had to undertake were easily available. What happened to our abhorrence of greed and theft? Why do we celebrate persons who today are wealthy with dubious sources of income and yet society is not concerned about what the source of income is and it's only about the person's wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, ethics have a direct impact on national development. And as a student of history, I can say unequivocally that in history, all civilizations that have fallen have done so after they lost their moral and ethical compass. It is our prayer that Ghana continues to maintain its moral compass in order that we can continue to ensure national development, prosperity, and dignity for our, uh, for our people. Isn't it? Like we know in elsewhere, in the UK and elsewhere, it's the systems that is making people do the right things, isn't it? Um, he says in the ECG, they were mm -hmm. raking in 450 uh, million a month. Yes, then they went in to check the systems, and by digitizing the systems, it has now turned from 450 a month to 1.2 billion Ghana cities a month. He said they did the same thing for the passport acquisition. Now that has increased revenue from 1 million a year to 64 million a year. So what do we need? <laughs> Is it a National Moral and Integrity Council? <laughs> yes, Dr. Pebby. Oh, sounds <laughs> 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 good. Well, first of all, congratulations to the Church of Pentecost for pulling this together. I, I think they've, they've done something that even as a country itself, we haven't done, you know, to bring opposition parties together, past presidents and you know, all the arms of government, parliament, judiciary, executive, and all of that. So kudos to them. And I am glad that as a church, um, they are realizing more and more that ours is not just to save souls, uh, but uh, the gospel is such that not only are people saved, but their circumstances uh, are transformed as well. And uh, what do we need? Yes. I, I, I heard the proposal, you know, for... <laughs> For this National Moral Integrity Council. And unfortunately, say, unfortunately, we are taking only a minute of your comments. We ran out of time. That, that's, that's fine. I, okay. I must say that I'm still chewing over it. Because my first, of, my first point, my first reaction is, oh boy, another council. You know, um, I, I think that, I don't know, maybe, maybe temporarily, but I think that the church in particular, knowing that their job is to transform lives, should focus on that because the gospel does change lives. When somebody at the IRS or the or what we call GRA, you know, who was stealing in the Bible, you call Zacchaeus, when he encountered Jesus, his life was changed. He, he, he decided that he would pay back anybody he had cheated, you know, as if four times, and then would give half of his wealth to the poor. You know, if the ministers who are stashing money if the people are IRA, uh, the GRA who are taking money out of the, the ports, if we all encountered the gospel that the Church of Pentecost is supposed to be proclaiming in its purity and its power, I believe that people will be transformed. And it's transformed people that transform a society. Mm -hmm. I like what the Vice President said. We could put systems in place, and surely we should. But don't forget, it's human beings who create systems. All right. And it's human beings who change systems. Thank you. So my thing is that mm -hmm. deeply transform people and deeply transform society. And Thank you. Maybe a council will help. Thank you very much. Um, so, <laughs> Dr. Sremsai, so uh, this is it. This is, uh, we say we are 70% or more mm -hmm. a Christian yes. nation, and then the rest, a greater majority Muslim. All of us looking up to Allah, God. And we go to the mosque on Friday, we go to church Saturday, Sunday, and yet, we need a, a National Moral and Integrity Council to get us to do the right things. But Dr. Bamiya says this is how we are getting it rightly done. <laughs> Systems are checking the people. 
from 450 million a month to 2.1.2 billion a month from 1 million a year to 64 million a year systems mm -hmm. i think there's something good about what the church of pentecost you know has done and i think the good in it is that they've admitted that there's a problem so we are all on the same page mm -hmm. as to what the problem is now problem caused by their members exactly exactly that's the point that their members church i mean christians and moral you know people who are supposed to be moral are the problem so they are calling for something the last time i checked about the peace council they were in Nogoku trying to resolve a dispute between mm. uh, uh, prophet Ajinasari and the people of Nogoku. i don't know what this moral council will be doing but i believe strongly that if the church all the churches together have not been able to change the heart of Ghanaians. If all the mosques together and all the religions together mm. have not been able to change the, the heart of Ghanaians, I doubt if a council, you know, whatever it is, this composition will do. That is why we go back to the system issue. But again, what is the point in having all these effective systems when those at the top can easily, you know, take away the money and spend it and then we'll come back to square one. So it's a, it's a chain issue. If you put but out the council... people at the churches, they say the moral character of the nation has dipped at all levels. Hence the need for the establishment of this NMIC to curb social vices. People have asked the question, those in the front pews, who are they? They are the very people that are holding those society mm. you know, away from what is good. And so if... I, I, the churches should is it is it an admission that they have failed and if they have failed are they moving away so that we set up a council and give them the responsibility of the church i mean the church should be able to explain this because i don't see what the council will do mm -hmm. which the church cannot do mm -hmm. unless it's another channel for spending the taxpayers money and not national resources to solve problems that the churches are supposed to do that's, I mean, that's too much meat spoil the broth <laughs> no, no no i think i don't i agree with doctor i mean what's what's that council for I mean, the, the 70 percent. So that they will con no, continually, your members. consistently no. <laughs> ensure there is a consciousness. <laughs> where elsewhere there is a minister of happiness, you know. <laughs> consistently, we've said various councils and councils and councils. What does it do to us? It doesn't add value to anything. Even talking about achieving financial targets, it's not part of moral values. You see, it depends on how you go about it. We are talking about moral values. So for me, the council is another time which I don't want to talk about. The church will focus on the, on, the, on the flock and teach them the values and tell them to apply the values. Because all these things are happening that on Sunday we all go to church. On Friday we all go to Muslims. How do people steal money? How do people drive people on the floor? How do the children, how do that young man help choke, choke that guy? Maybe we should host the brains behind this, like uh, Dr. Stromsai said. Yeah. What is it that the church is doing that the moral uh, whatever authority will now come and do what they, is the church not doing enough well they should do far more than what they're saying the values are going down as is admitted if you go to any church they, they, you see people are now looking at money not the soul mm. so the soul needs to be transformed unfortunately now it's wealth it's not about winning souls it's about wealth and when wealth take over then the morality gone. And this is exactly so i would urge the churches that they should go back to what the the bible says and teach people the values the values are in the bible the but they have been teaching no, they have been no, teaching no. for See, how you know, many years tomorrow, tomorrow, the thing is that tomorrow they will invite me people don't i steal them. i steal money they invite me to be the chairman of the finance committee uh, the harvest committee and i'll give you money and when i give you money nobody check the source of my money i mean that is where the issue comes in <laughs> mm. <laughs> See, there was a time when Jesus went to the synagogue and whipped everybody. Mm. Why? Because he realized that what they were saying <laughs> was completely different from what they were doing. Exactly. So then he has to whip them to remind them that don't just be telling the people what to do, but do what you are saying. So if you keep rewarding people who you know, or you have reasonable cause to believe that have committed crimes, you, have, you give them front pews, you give them positions in the church, and you come back and say, let's all do the right thing. The people know 
that then you are not being honest with them and they will disregard whatever you are saying and find a way of surviving. Interesting. Interesting. My guest uh, on News File uh, that you have been hearing have been Justice Strom Sai, uh, Senior Lecturer, Faculty of Law, GIMPA, and uh, Managing Partner, Petroleum Solicitors, Dr. Richard Echiahene is Corporate Governance and Banking Consultant, Solomon Partners and Financial Consults uh, Limited. We had spoken and um, hosted Amechi in Suffolk, cross-border asset recovery expert. Also, Mary Ada, uh, acting executive director, Ghana Integrity Initiative. She believes that this, uh, you know, vision, moral uh, vision is important and we need to find a way around it. I don't know if she supports the counsel that they are suggesting, though. We also had Dr. Yao Pebi, medical director, global CEO, um, HUD Group, and steering committee member, the Ghana Compact. Uh, we had Alfred Tuya Yeboa, Deputy Attorney General and Minister of Justice. Join me tomorrow um, afternoon at 2 p.m. on the, um, the law. And uh, we'll be dealing with uh, data protection, and your obligations, and the sanctions that apply. And we'll be hosting Patricia Edusai Poko, who is Executive Director of the Data Protection Commission. Gentlemen and lady, thank you so very much for making your time, uh, making time to join us this afternoon. Have a good afternoon.